In Cape Girardeau, I told a feature about a guy who him and his granddaughters really liked Taylor Swift music and they would listen to it all the time and went to concerts, did that story. And then two days later on Christmas Eve, Taylor Swift showed up to their house in New Madrid, Missouri. Welcome to How Do You Do That? I'm your host, John Pham. In this episode, my guest, Hank Cavanaro, shares his journey as a multimedia journalist and offers insights into the world of journalism. He'll be sharing his secrets for finding great stories, the value of putting in the work, and how to use your career capital to open doors to new opportunities. So without further ado, let's dive in and hear from Hank. All right. Hey, Hank. Hello there. <laughs> Good to see you Good in see Oklahoma City. No, thanks for coming by the station too. Yeah, thanks for inviting me in. It's a beautiful space. I mean, like I told you, we've been in here a month, so it's just been cool to see a new space and in, in the state-of-the-art studio that most TV stations don't have. Yeah. Can I get a tour later? Yeah, I'll give you a tour. Nice. All no right. No problem. <laughs> hey, well, listeners, I will record if I'm allowed to. Sure. And then I'll uh, post it on social media too so you can see this super swanky space to open you said a month ago yeah november 13th was our first day in this new building we had sales move in like a month before and the biggest thing is we had to we had to move a working tv station so we had to take a tv station that was you know a couple miles north and within the course of 36 hours less than that we had to get all of the technology that made that station work into this new building oh my gosh yeah and, okay so you just moved to Oklahoma City from Austin. Mm -hmm. Has it been six months yet? About. It was June. Yeah, June. we came at the very beginning of June. So yeah, it's okay. been six months. So you moved all of your stuff from Austin mm -hmm. to Oklahoma City. And then you started a job where you started to move all of your work stuff from one building yeah. to another building. So it's actually funny. I had a box in the corner of my office that I brought everything from like my last desk in. Mm -hmm. And that box stayed there for the four or five months. And then I just put everything back in the box and moved it down. I shuffled it to yeah, the station. Yeah, so everybody else was... Like struggling to find boxes, and I still have my moving box. So. Holy cow. So now you live in Oklahoma City. Yeah. For those that, you know, haven't spent, spent much time in Oklahoma City, but maybe are more familiar with Austin, how would you describe Oklahoma City to them? Yeah. So I do a lot of recruiting for my new job. So one of the things I tell people all the time on the phone is I was like, I was in Austin, and like one of the best things about Austin is there's always something to do. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing about Austin is there's always something to do. <laughs> and you always feel like you have to be busy doing something and going here, going there, and then with cost of living there, it was just so expensive. Whereas Oklahoma City, you can almost pick and choose your spots a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So you can decide, hey, I want to go. I want to go out tonight. There's plenty of bars and restaurants and awesome places that you can kind of go explore. Or if you want to, you know, hang out and chill, it feels like it's almost, I don't know, more accepted. Not more accepted. That might be a little too harsh on Austin. But it just feels like you can pick and choose a little bit more. So that part's been really cool. But I think it also has more to offer than a lot of people think. So one of the things we loved about Austin was Austin's a great food city. And this is like a growing food city. So I think it was on Bon Appetit's like top 20 something. You'd have to fact check that. But yeah. it's a city that is getting more and more food and more and more culture kind of here. There's a lot already here and it's just kind of getting that highlighted a little bit more. Yeah, there are definitely restaurants that Kelly and I will go to in Oklahoma City and we'll walk in and be like, whoa, like this feels like it could be an Austin restaurant. I think yeah. before growing up here, I didn't feel like a lot of the restaurants had that sort of youthful mm -hmm. up and coming vibe, but yeah. there are great restaurants like Palin Thai. Have you been there yet? No, we haven't. It's in more. It's phenomenal. Okay. Okay. And then there's have you been yeah, I'm sure you've been to Hall's Pizza already, right? We haven't. We just passed by. We went to um have you been to Barrios right in front of Hall's yeah, Pizza? Yeah. We Barrios went there last too. night. That's great. We were talking about before Oso is one of our mm -hmm. favorites. Yeah, there's just kind of a lot of places that really do feel like they would succeed in Austin too. Yeah. It sounds like you're settling down well in Oklahoma City and glad to have more Austin friends in Oklahoma City as yeah, well. So, gives you people to hang out with when you're back home. Yeah, absolutely. So what did you study in school? Mm -hmm. Did you study journalism? Yeah. So, okay, I went to KU, University of Kansas. Rock to Chalk. Be, Rock Chalk Jayhawk. Uh, <laughs> I went to go be pre-med. So I had a completely different career path. Oh, I did not know you were pre-med. Yeah, pre-med for a semester. Okay. And then took bio and Kim and realized this probably wasn't going to work out. Um, <laughs> At least you realized early I realized on. real early, which was helpful. Because then I was able to kind of adjust and, and really take a stab in the dark and got lucky. So I was like, you know what? I really like sports. I've always really liked sports. So I switched to journalism because it meant I get to cover sports. So I wasn't good enough at sports to make that a living. Talking about sports, we'll try that. And I was sports focused all through college. So sports journalism. So I was covering University of Kansas basketball press conferences and football press conferences and games and everything. 
And when I was getting towards, you know, graduation, of course, the classes teach you just sports and news Mm -hmm. made me focus on news a little bit more. When I was getting to graduation, started applying for jobs, I put out a bunch of applications, some for sports, some for news. I was getting a whole lot of calls back for news, not as much for sports. Not it. And also like our industry, it's, it's, you work in smaller markets for a while. And with sports, I would have been in the middle of nowhere for a whole lot longer. I started in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, which is a small town, but market wise, it's market 82. Okay. Which I guess doesn't mean a whole lot of people outside. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's not the number. There's 210 TV markets in the country. So the country split up in 210 pieces. New York is like number one. It has the most people inside that TV market. Mm. LA's two, Chicago's three, Philly's four, Dallas is five. Just kind of what you expect. Some markets are not just the city that they're based in, but a large geographical area around it. So like here in Oklahoma City, we cover, I think it's like 60% of the state. Wow. Maybe it's maybe it's a little less because we also have a station in Tulsa, our sister station. Between the two of us, it's like two-thirds of the state. But geographically, you know, each market can be differing in size. So I started in Cape Girardeau, which was market 82 out of 210, but it's because Cape Girardeau was part of a TV market that was geographically very large. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I was there for two years before moving to Austin. If I was in sports, there's a very realistic possibility that Cape Girardeau would have been my second or third stop. And to get to Austin, it would have been, you know, 10 years instead of two. So switching to news kind of gave me a little bit more of an opportunity to live in places I wanted to live quicker. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Is that because sports and sports reporting just has more people applying for it? Or is it because there's just less spots? Or is that a mix of both? Mix of both. Mix of both. Yeah. So you have, um, I'll give my station here in Oklahoma City as an example. Our news reporting staff is 18 people. Mm -hmm. That's not counting our our anchors. The entire sports department, anchors, reporters, producer, editor is four people. Oh, wow. Yeah. So in Cape Girardeau, we had 10 reporters, 8 to 10 reporters two sports people. Mm-hmm. Austin was like 12 and three sports people. So in every single station, there's, you know, one, two, three, maybe four, because we have a pretty large sports department here, four people as opposed to 20 jobs that I could be applying for. Got it. Yeah. So you studied journalism mm-hmm. and then you went to Missouri. Yeah. What were you doing in Missouri? Did, did you feel like your degree really equipped you for what you needed to do? So I think the things I did outside of my degree really equipped me for what I needed to do. Oh, really? So, yeah, there's probably only two classes I used on a day-to-day basis. Okay. So I was a multimedia journalist, which means I'm the photographer, reporter, the editor. Um, I get assigned a story, and I see it all the way through till the end, and it aired, and I would be live on television to mm-hmm. front it. So in my advanced reporting class, obviously I was using quite a bit. There was a couple other journalism classes where I would learn things here and there, but the biggest thing was internships and working at a campus TV station and getting real experience, you know, with a camera in my hand and actually having to write stories and practice that way. Yeah. That was where I got the most experience that equipped me for my job. I see. When you said you were like a multimedia journalist and specialist, you had to do all of your own video, audio, writing and storytelling, (laughs) recording. Did you learn that on the job or how did? Yeah. And I think a lot of journalism schools set people up now. That's kind of where our industry for for better or for worse is going, where like our staff of reporters here, I'll say reporters and MMJs interchangeably because our staff is entirely MMJs. Other stations, it's it's a mix of both or just reporters and reporters would work with a photographer who would handle the audio and visual side of it while they're figuring out the storytelling and words. MMJs really is a blend of it all. I like it because I like having control over everything Uh and I like being able to take a concept and know exactly what I need and, and see it to completion. And don't get me wrong, I've worked with some phenomenal photographers along the way and love that collaboration aspect. But then I feel whenever I work with somebody who's really good at the photography side, I seal something and then I can keep working on it, Mm -hmm. you know, as an MMJ. But yeah, I think a lot of colleges now equip people with that skill, knowing that you're going to have to learn how to shoot. You're going to have to learn how to edit. If you want your stories to look better, you got to learn how to be better at those skills too. Yeah. It sounds like MMJ roles are challenging in the sense that you need to have both technical skills you need to know how the technical functions of shooting yeah how cameras work and stuff yeah cameras work and then you also have a lot of soft skills and like emotional intelligence Mm -hmm. where you have to be able to tell a story and be able to you know captivate an audience and And interview you know Mm -hmm. it's a skill that not everybody has from listening to your podcast you do a really good job of interviewing and it's it is a soft skill that not that's really hard to teach and that's one of those things like 
the more you do it, the easier it gets, the better you get at it, the more you pick up on things here and mm-hmm. there. But yeah, it really is. You have to have the technical skills to like learn an editing software that is really daunting to a lot of people. But the more you, again, it's, it's reps, you know, the more you use it, the more you learn what tools you need. You don't need half the stuff, more than half the stuff in an editing suite. Yeah. So it's, you know, the more you use it, the more you realize the things that you need and the things that you don't. Mm. But yeah, you have to have those technical skills mixed with the skills of interviewing people mixed with the learning how to write things. And it, I mean, it just takes more time. I say it takes more time. There's also times where I feel I can work quicker because I know exactly what I need and exactly how to get it. And once I get it, I'm done. Mm. As opposed to if I'm working, like, let's say I'm working with a photographer and I don't communicate effectively. They're out there and they're shooting everything because they don't know what I'm going to write to. Mm -hmm. And then we get back and I hit and grab that. And like as a reporter, I need to write to what they grab. But if they didn't grab what I wanted, then that's my fault because I should have explained it. Sorry, we're getting in the weeds of how like Uh working with a partner works in news. But yeah, it really is a mix of of these kind of more technical skills, these softer skills, and then just doing it all quickly and under stress and then it looking good at the very end. Yeah, absolutely. So do you still do what you started out doing? Could you share more about your journey from working in Missouri mm-hmm. to Texas mm-hmm. to now Oklahoma. I don't know if you had any other steps in between. No, nope, those are the steps. Okay. okay, so I was general assignment, which means whatever the day called for, that's the story I was on. So it could be a feature about, in Cape Girardeau, I told a feature about a guy who him and his granddaughters really liked Taylor Swift music and they would listen to it all the time and went to concerts, did that story, and then two days later on Christmas Eve, Taylor Swift showed up to their house in New Madrid, Missouri. So did you meet Taylor Swift? No. No, and I have a whole other story on that one. They told me, I was like, hey, if anything happens, if Taylor like writes you back, let me know. Like, we'll come down and do another story. And then we get all these messages being like, Taylor came, Taylor came, Taylor came. I'm like, no, no way. That's got to be fake. And then I like text the lady who's, it was her dad. So she texts me and goes, yeah, I didn't know. I'm like, how'd you not know? You oh, knew. man. So I, I wish they had told me. We would have gone down and done a story. But still, like anything from that to like covering a house fire or homicide or, you know, whatever the news of the day is. So. Cape Girardeau was all general assignment. Every day was different. Every day you're on a different story. And at the end of the day, you're done with your story and you walk away and you come do it again the next day. Mm-hmm. When I got to Austin, I was still doing the same thing. After a couple of years, I had kind of carved out a role where I was good at telling those types of feature stories, those lighter hearted, the, the good side of the world. Mm-hmm. And me and an executive producer had come up with a plan where instead of me reporting five days a week, new story every day, I would do two or three stories a week, but the quality of them had to be better. And they were just focusing on the good side of life. Oh, wow. So before you keep going on your journey, Mm -hmm. it sounds like you had developed these skill sets. And I talk about this on one of my podcasts about how it's so important for people to develop career capital and to get better at their role. And as they develop more career capital, they're able to exchange their career capital Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. more control and to leverage it to do more things that they like. Is that what you did? Did you go through like a negotiation process with your manager on that. Mm -hmm. I talk about this all the time, actually. I say chips, career Mm -hmm. capital, same thing. I go out and I do that really hard story. You earn a chip that day Mm -hmm. and you take them and you're like, hey, you know, I I have all these chips here. I want to go tell this feature story and you get to cash them in. You have to take that and actually do something with it and prove to them like, no, this was a good decision. And then you either earn all your chips back or some of your chips back. And you're kind of playing this game back and forth with managers like, hey, you know, I, I did this hard sort. Let me go do this one that I want to do. And it's a little bit more of like a one for you, one for me type thing. And you try to mm-hmm. find that. I'd built up enough where me and this EP kind of went together and were like, hey, let's, let's put all these chips in. Because she had to convince her boss and my boss that this job made sense. It was creating a new position kind of out of thin air. And we'd lose, you know, quantity of stories a day to increase the quality of them. I see. So her and I kind of pulled our chips, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. We we dumped them in, and then we started this role on March seventh, twenty twenty, which a week later everything went to hell. Right. So we, <laughs> it, honestly, I think if my start date of that new position was two weeks later, I don't think I ever would have switched because they were like, "Hey, you know, we need everybody covering the hard news." Mm-hmm. But actually, that EP came to me and was like, "Hey, I know we said two or three a week, but I need something good in my newscast every day." Like right now, everybody is seeing death and destruction. I need some sort of breath of fresh air. So I was turning a lot more than what we had initially agreed on, but it was it was the lighter side. It was still kind of that like, let's find something good. And there were a lot of good stories that kind of came through that. And so after after a while of doing that, I, I went back, re-signed a new contract, and I, I also added the idea of storytelling coaching onto it, where I had been helping a lot of our MMJs get better on a daily basis. 
that title kind of gave me a little bit of a title to go along with the role that I was already doing and allowed me to do it a little bit more and have a little bit more institutional trust, not just the people trust me because they've seen what I can do and, and what me helping them helps them do. And that is honestly how I got the job here in Oklahoma City. Um, so the job here is I have a big fancy title, multimedia storytelling supervisor. That's a lot of words. That's a lot of words. But it also like in our industry, it kind of like multimedia is, is because I'm uh -huh. in charge of multimedia journalists. Storytelling, because that at the end of the day is what is what I'm helping people on as opposed to just like, uh, I always use an example in our newsroom. A report tells mm -hmm. me who, what, when, where, and a story tells me why and why I should care. Oh, so nice. I work a lot of times on, on getting our MMJs to work on storytelling and telling me why and why I should care about this information that our viewers need to know. Mm -hmm. So multimedia fits with MMJ, storytelling fits with that, and then supervisor because I'm a supervisor and I'm, I'm one of our upper managers here. So do, how many people do you have on your team now? So I'm in charge of a staff of about 18. 18. Oh, wow. Yeah. All MMJs. All MMJs. We have a couple people who are on that staff that will get to work with a photographer. We have somebody who's a crime reporter. We're not going to send her to go door knock on a mm -hmm. neighborhood where there was just a shooting last night by herself. She gets a photographer every day of the week just to kind of help with that. And in return, she gives us a little bit more quantity of stories a day. She helps mm -hmm. with, you know, fill the shows because she's getting that help from a photographer. Wow. You started off as an MMJ and you were going out, filming stories, recording mm -hmm. them. Now you're in a management position. Yeah. Do you still get to go out and film and shoot or so the team do that? That's the goal. That's in the job description. Um, okay. Less than I was doing even in Austin. But my goal is, is about once or twice a month as opposed to two or three a week. I have a lot more responsibilities on the newsroom side of it than I, I did before. Because as an MMJ, again, I would get to work with a photographer every once in a while. But I was kind of responsible for my own thing. Now I'm responsible for 18 people's things. Oh, wow. You know, so I'm in charge of other people. As an MMJ, I was able to just kind of like not hide in a corner, but able to just take care of myself and do my job. And then I was there to help the newsroom when they needed it. But I could also kind of like kind of blend in a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Here I don't have that as much. But the goal is to be able to go out and still tell stories because also I think there's a big difference between like managing people and leading people. Mm-hmm. Me doing the job helps lead as opposed to manage. Showing that like I'm not I'm not just telling you, you know, here's what you should do. It's like, hey, here's what you should do and here's how it looks when it's done. You know, mm -hmm. this is why you should do it too. Yeah, like this is this is sort of the bar that mm -hmm. I'd like for you to achieve and shoot for. Yeah, keep keep striving for. So I still get to tell stories every once in a while. It's just fewer and farther between because there's other things. Um when I accepted the job, we had five open positions, which most newsrooms five is like you're struggling to get your stuff on air every day. Mm -hmm. But because we have such a large staff, it allows us some flexibility. And when we're down five, we're still functioning a little bit more stressed, but we're still functioning. So I've hired five people and then through hired five hot, hired. Oh, I was hired. Like, <laughs> so I had five open positions, hired five. And then for people taking other jobs or, or different reasons, we still have three more. So I've been doing a lot of the hiring and recruiting side of my job. Got it. As opposed to getting out there and telling stories, okay, but man, it's still part of it. Yeah, they brought you in and had to give you the axe and chop it down a bit, huh? No, no, no. <laughs> We've been good on that side. We've been good on that side. And that was, I think, more I wanted that side of the job. Mm -hmm. I think if I was like, hey, I don't want to touch recruiting and hiring, they would have been like, okay, cool. And they would have handled it the way that they had been handling it. Yeah, I wanted to say in that I think it's it helps me do my job more effectively if I get the right people in who are going to be either receptive to that or have some of the skills that I can then, instead of teaching them the skill set, I'm... I'm elevating their skill sets. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. So you're looking for people that are coachable and mm -hmm. people that are willing to learn. I work in strategy and operations now mm -hmm. uh, for this healthcare tech company. And when I was interviewing with my now manager, he said his primary thing is looking for somebody that's curious and willing to learn. Obviously, there's a baseline level of knowledge that you need to for do sure. certain types of work. But he's like, I can teach you the skill sets that you need to learn to be successful. But if you don't have a mentality, like a growth mindset and a willingness to learn, that's really hard to mm -hmm. like coach and you have to develop that yourself. You have to be born with it. Yeah. Or yeah. It has to be something that you have. Yeah. It sounds like that's kind of what you're looking for as well. Yeah. And we talk about here the ideal team player, somebody who's willing to be humble, hungry, smart. So have the skill sets, but then also be willing to learn more and then have those kind of soft skills to communicate where it's a working newsroom and tempers fly all the time. But mm -hmm. like, it's one of those understanding that that is people working in stress and stressful situations. And that's just kind of how life works and able to like manage that. Yeah. Yeah. That's gotta be, that's gotta be 
a whole different challenge, mm-hmm. but you talked about being on general assignment. So yeah, earlier yeah. on, it sounds like there was a story and then you were sort of pointed in that direction to go capture mm-hmm. and make that story come alive. But it sounds like as you progressed in your career, you started to sort of be able to look for your own stories and maybe source for your own stories. Is that how it works? Well, kind of. So every day when you're on general assignment, you come in and you pitch stories. You're like, hey, here are some things that I can go turn. You have newsroom discussions and people are like, okay, let's go for this today, tonight, whatever it is. And you get assigned a story and then you go. So I've always been like looking for things. And again, that's where those like chips come in. Like I would do three stories that they would want me to do. Mm. I would also want to do them. But like, let's say three stories that they wanted me to do that I would like didn't necessarily like to do. Worked hard on those. That's when you kind of get that chip and you're like, hey, I, there's this really cool story. Let me go tell the story. The Taylor Swift guy. Let me go tell his story. Like a lot of newscasts, you're not going to necessarily see that story. Yeah. But it took that negotiating skills early to be able to like, let me then go you got to trust me on this one. Mm-hmm. And it turns out really good. And then again, you get those chips back. But early on in general assignment, it was that where it was, I would come up with pitches and then they'd be like, let's go do this one. By the time I got into that special projects role, it was me and EP and be like, Hey, here are three stories I want to go do. And she'd be like, yes, yes. And I don't know about the third one. And then I would just go do those two. And then when they were ready, they would air. So it was almost self-assigning. There was a little bit of a check and balance, but it wasn't like here's three and one got picked and then you'd kind of move on. It was like, Here's three I want to do. And sometimes she'd be like, go, go do them. Tell me when they're done and we'll, we'll get them on TV. So I did get a little bit more autonomy there, which that special projects role and the role I'm in now and the storytelling, like those don't exist at every TV station. Got it. The role I'm in now, our station, our sister station in Tulsa are the only places I've heard of this job. Oh, it's not wow. like it's a common one, mm-hmm. um, which is probably why it has a fancy title that's way too long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when you're looking for a good, story Mm -hmm. how do you how do you know you're on to something like how do you know that you know this has potential so i think the biggest thing is layers having a story that as we're going down and we're telling you the story there's little little moments that i'm going to be able to capture there's little surprises and reveals and things that you're can i cuss on this yeah yeah okay 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 (laughs) Um, i call them like oh shit moments where like Uh, you're going through and you're like oh shit didn't see that coming (laughs) like those types of things when you can find a story that has the layers it's not just one layer deep it's not just like here's the information it's it's, oh oh my god they got sick or oh my god the person who was coaching them when they were five came back around to their life and those two people are the people that we've been talking about the whole time Mm -hmm. stories like that where there's layers to it are the best and then anytime you can do that with i I call it a hard news backbone Mm -hmm. um anytime you can tell a feature story that is really connecting with a, with a person, telling one person's story or one group of people's story. But then there's this harder news angle, whether it's people dealing with addiction or, or things like that, that really help drive home that seriousness of what we're showing. Those stories, I think, are always the best. One of the last ones I did in Austin was about an addiction recovery place. That was a farm. And so all the people would go and they'd be working on this farm. All of the vegetables that they would pick would go to a farmer's market. All the money that was raised would go to sober living scholarships. So people that got out of this addiction recovery place would then get to go to a sober living facility and continue their sobriety journey. Oh, wow. Again, there's layers there. And the reason the guy started it is because his son was an addict and sent him off to a horse farm in Washington. And that was the first place where it worked. He's like, Texas needs this too. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those where there's layers to it and I keep revealing little pieces along the way. Those are the best stories. Yeah. They're not always easy to find, but those are the best ones. No, I love that. That makes a lot of sense. You want layers, maybe an element of surprise and coincidence. Mm-hmm. I, I always think about storytelling and as I've been talking to people on the podcast, the most interesting journeys are ones where you sort of ping pong around. Yeah. And I think if you have a journey that's just kind of flat and you you just kind of progress in the same direction the whole time. It wouldn't make for a very great movie, and so I don't think it'd make for a very interesting story either. I love when there are layers to people and their journeys as well. Yeah, and things, I mean, life's not linear. You know, mm-hmm. like, life does not go in a, in a single, a straight path. Like, I wanted to be a pediatrician. Then uh, that was not going to end up happening after freshman year of high school, or freshman year of college. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's, I mean, life isn't linear. Why should the stories that we tell on the news be just, like, really straightforward? Mm-hmm. Um, or people's career paths. Again, they're not, they're not going to be linear. Yeah. Life is tough. So I was scrolling through your Vimeo. I think you had like mm-hmm. a yeah, reel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I started going down this funnel of like old Hank yeah. content. And it yeah. was really great to see your different stories. I would see you go to a farmer's market. You'd be in somebody's bedroom. You would be yeah. in a studio taking photos. What was it like just, I don't know, like wandering into people's personal spaces? Yeah. So you had talked about like those soft skills. Mm-hmm. Um, 
one of the hardest things is is being in those places, whether it's, you know, somebody's room or, or a farmer's market and you're like behind the table with them or in a photography studio, being there and like making them feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are, are really scared of cameras. And the, the biggest thing is like trying to get people where they realize that it's not so scary. It's You're still just talking to me. There just happens to be a camera over my shoulder. Right. That definitely took, again, it's reps, it's practice. It's getting used to it and like finding the little things that kind of help people be a little bit more at ease. Depending on who the person was, I would curse so that like they felt comfortable. <laughs> and if they curse, like I would just work around it. But like it's one of those where I'm not like an uptight person. So uh-huh. like, why should reporter Hank be an uptight person? Yeah. And even here I talk with all of our MJs all the time. I'm like, we didn't hire, you know. I'll use Haley as one of the names of our MMJs. I didn't hire reporter Haley. Like I hired Haley to be Haley. Like I want you to talk like you talk as opposed to being, you know, a reporter. But there's these like soft skills to try to get people like that and then try to disarm them with the camera. And sometimes there's photographers who like first thing they'll do, they'll take the camera, get really close to their face because then anywhere else the camera is, it doesn't feel that scary. You know, it's like, it's a little bit, and it's, you got to have the right person. It's not the first thing that happens, but Hmm. you go off the shoulder and get like kind of close to someone. And then if the camera's on the tripod 20 feet away, it's like they're not worried about it there. Yeah. They're worried about it when it was in their face <laughs> that first time. And it's, you know, it, but it's like little tricks like that to earn people's trust. And that, again, reps. I talk about reps all the time. It's like the more things that you can do where like even if a story you're going through it and you're like, I hate this story assignment. Like this is not going to be a good story. If you can practice one of those things, that day then was worth it. You know, you got mm-hmm. to practice how to disarm someone with the camera type thing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's already a challenge to when you're with people to make them comfortable in things. I think even before you get there, I'm I'm wondering if you've experienced, you know, you have a great idea for a story and then Mm -hmm. you approach someone and they're like, I don't want any part of this. And they turn you away and don't want to do this. Does that happen? Like, do reporters get rejected on stories by people? All, All the time, especially on day of. And it's usually you don't get there by that point. Like they've rejected you on the phone call when you're like, hey, I want to do this story. And they're like, I don't want to. And then that's where that ends. Uh huh. And I have, a, I have a friend who works in San Diego. His name is Joe Little. He talks about young reporters always explain, like, too much of the story sometimes, which sounds weird. I don't want to, like, gotcha journalism trap people. But, like, if I'm going to do a story on the cost of inflation and affecting local businesses, I'll just call him like, hey, we're doing a story on local businesses. Not, mm-hmm. hey, we're doing a story on local businesses and how inflation is really hurting you guys and how your your careers are kind of going down the drain. Like, that's – you're giving them too, in, too much information. <laughs> And that's going to scare people off. Whereas if you're like, hey, I'm doing a story on local businesses and, and with inflation and everything, but like, we just want to do a story on you. Mm-hmm. Then they say yes. And you're like, yeah. And like this inflation right now. And people will usually more times than not go off on that rabbit hole themselves. Yeah. I think if you give them too much, maybe they start to envision all the things that they might say or things that might yep. go wrong. And their so- head starts spinning. They're going through it all. And I'm not, again, I'm not advocating that like journalists need to hide what they're like ulterior motives are like that's not good for our industry either but it's finding the little ways to like not trick people but like you don't need to tell them every little bit of what you're doing sometimes i do when i'm there that's one of the tricks though that i would like use to let people behind the curtain and be like oh i'm gonna grab this shot it just helps me where i then edit it together and i swear it's gonna look really cool and they will then be along for the ride and they're part of telling their own story so there's times to like reveal a little bit more and then there's times to be a little bit more like hey we're just doing a story yeah so yeah usually if if you're there and the camera's on you your story is going to happen it usually happens on the phone calls which there's been plenty of those phone calls how often do you build a story and then you bring it and then it's maybe just not up to par and the quality is not as as you hope do you still push those or how many of the stories do you end up discarding there's probably only a handful in my okay. like entire career where i've shot it and i'm going through it and i'm like this is not this is not going to work out. There's sometimes where either we're going through a story and like there's some facts that aren't adding up. We'll hold the story and be like, eh, "We're this is not ready for air today. We need to we need to hold it." And those are tough conversations that newsrooms have across the country. If mm-hmm. if you're going through it and you're like, "This isn't adding up. I I think we're wrong here." Got it. And you hold the story. That's probably more common than like you're going, you're doing the story, you shot it all, you put it together, and you're like, mm, I don't like it now. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you so- put in so much work at that point, and especially like. For people, most most reporters are general assignment. When you get to that point, like you've put in so much work and you, you usually have to have a product at the end of the day. You better have a really good reason if you don't. Right. And that um, makes sense because yeah. I think you probably have got a good process around picking your stories and what you're going to go after so you know yeah. before you go shoot it if it's going to be worthwhile or not. Yeah. And sometimes like so a lot of the stories I was doing at KV before I came here were, you know, two and a half, three, five minute stories like mm-hmm. 
those, I know the elements that I'm building into before I even get there to shoot. On general assignment stuff, sometimes you don't know, but also general assignment stories are normally a minute and a half, mm-hmm. you know, minute to a minute and a half. And if you're, you're going through it and like you don't have all the elements that make sense for that minute and a half story, there's shorter presentations that we'll do. So instead of it being a full story, we do what's called a VOSAT. VO is voiceover. A SOT is sound on tape. Mm. Old timey lingo. Anyway, we'll do like a shorter version of a story. And that's you only need one sound bite as opposed to a, a normal package. We'll have, you know, five to ten. So if you don't have as much as you thought you were going to get, there's other ways to still get a product out on TV that's not, you know, the traditional end goal of your day. Yeah. So how long have you been, how many years have you been doing this for now? So I've been full-time six and a half, but the last like two years in college, I was either interning or working at TV stations. So so over the last eight years of storytelling and building stories, do you have any like most memorable ones or favorite ones that you think about often? It's tough because every story, there's a different reason like that would bring it up. Like the Taylor Swift story I hadn't thought about until earlier today. Somebody mm-hmm. was saying they were reaching out to somebody's a musician's manager and they were wanting to do a story. I'm like, remind me later. I need to tell you my Taylor <laughs> Swift story. I have a lot of stories that like I pushed my chips into the table and I got them back for like I, there was one in Austin I did on whiskey and Texas whiskey and what makes Texas whiskey, Texas whiskey and the things that made it unique and different and an ever growing culture around it and, and commerce around it. Most stations in the country were not going to let a reporter do a four and a half minute story on whiskey, but I'd convinced them to. And then the product was was good, and I got my chips back. So you, you convinced your boss that you were going to go do a story on Texas whiskey. Mm-hmm. You got to go. I, I got assume. to go to Garrison Brothers, Treaty Oak, and still Austin and oh. talk to them, and it was awesome. You get to taste some whiskey on the job, too. Yeah, well, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. They also, I needed a bottle because part of that, I did like some some shots. Actually, it was in our kitchen when we lived on Perez mm-hmm. in, in Austin. And I just did some like shots on our kitchen table that's like part of the intro and the outro of that story. And that one was, again, that was, I pushed a lot of chips in. I'm like, it's going to be good. And I just got a new camera, so I got a new toy. I really wanted to play with it. <laughs> that story made sense for it. And I was able to do this story, and it turned out really well. I kind of earned my chips. Another one of an example of that, there's only me and a coworker were watching. There was a docuseries on Netflix called QB1, mm-hmm. and they followed high school seniors that like were star quarterbacks throughout their senior year and their recruiting process and all the all of that, following them through every game and stuff like that. Me and a coworker were watching it and texting back and forth, being like, we could totally do this. <laughs> and of course, we're not going to do the same quality that a Netflix documentary uh-huh. will have, but we, we pitched this idea of doing something we called Before the Snap. Mm-hmm. And the whole idea was the week before a football game, let's follow a team, you know, through their, you know, week leading up to it. And we weren't there for everything, but we tried to get into schools when we could, we would talk to coaches. We'd talk to star players. We'd find those storylines, and we did. The first one was 20 minutes. We did a 15-minute episode and a 10-minute episode. We only did three for one football season. I had to take every chip I'd ever earned and push <laughs> that into the table. You went all in. That one was tough, and it was me and then our sports guy at KVU, Jake. We we kind of pushed all of our chips, and like we were able to do it. I was not necessarily assigning myself for a while after that. I was doing the stories that I had been accustomed to doing, but I was doing a lot of them for them because I needed to earn that trust back. And then once they kind of saw the finished product, we ended up doing an hour and a half, like, I don't even know what to call it. We did like a live show or pre-recorded show that aired Thanksgiving. So instead of having people have to come into work at three o'clock on Thanksgiving, we aired an hour and a half of these stories plus some other sports stories that we had done throughout the year and put together like a special. And so like once they saw kind of how that worked and all of that stuff, that was when you, you earned that trust back. And like I had really supportive bosses down there too. I had earned the trust to be able to go try these kind of crazy products. But again, the the end product matched what I was pitching them. Mm-hmm. I think that's what a lot of people get in trouble when they when they promise something and then under deliver. And yeah. like you don't get those chips back. Mm-hmm. Those are gone. You don't you don't get those back. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You've talked a lot about the best parts about your role and just mm-hmm. the flexibility and being able to do that. What are some of the challenges of being a reporter? Like what are some of the things that people maybe don't know about the industry or people who maybe don't work in the industry don't have a good understanding of can you share some light on that i think a lot of people think we make a bunch of money and we we don't we <laughs> don't it's a very underpaid profession and a lot of people do it because they they love to do it and you kind of have to because it is it is long hours it's hard it's stressful you're underpaid and and underappreciated in a lot of places and and that's tough yeah you know it's it's an industry where you come in you don't necessarily know what you're doing that day and 
eight and a half hours after you kind of start your day, you have to have a finished product every single day. Um, like there's just, especially as an MMJ, like the, a joke is like getting a lunch break. Like you, you don't get a lunch break. A lunch break is, is eating your lunch at your desk. That's better than eating it in your car. It is really long and stressful. And when you're doing these day turns day in and day out, especially if you're trying to grow and trying to have this, you know, growth mindset and be better every day, it's really hard to find time to like just kind of coast through the day. Like there, there isn't, you know, I think it's a lot of work and, and again, through reps, you learn skills that help you speed up that process. And, and that's why, like for me, when I talk about being as MMJ, as opposed to working with a photographer, those things that I know I need to get, if I get this certain type of shot, I'm going to be able to write directly to that. And then I now know, instead of having to do a minute and a half, I'm now down to a minute 20 that I have to fill and create. Cause I already know 10 seconds is going to look like this. Mm -hmm. um, but before you learn those, cause you only learn those by doing them. I can tell everybody, every trick I have, but still until you do it and do it regularly, like you don't think of all of them. You're really creating something from nothing every day. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. With like newspapers, for example, mm -hmm. a lot of news is shifting to other mediums and other media. How is the news industry being impacted now by, I don't know, like a Twitter where people are also getting mm -hmm. different types of news there and, does that impact news growth or your audience at all? Or It's tough and it's different from market to market. You look here in Oklahoma City, it's a, a more traditional news market where okay. people get the Oklahoman. They watch News 9. You know, they're, they're working their way through more traditional media sources, whereas Austin, like our viewership, was not as high as it is here. There's more people in mm -hmm. Austin. We still have more viewers here every day. Oh, wow. Yeah. And like Cape Girardeau, so there's, there's a ratings and it's, percentage and I don't even know how it goes into it but like Nielsen if you ever get an envelope and it says hey fill out the survey fill it out you get 20 bucks that's how Nielsen works they, yeah. they do ratings based on they used to send out the stuff it was a, it was a giant booklet and you had to fill out what you were watching at every hour you had the tv on yeah funny enough Nielsen came to our home in Austin uh -huh. and typically you wouldn't be able to tell people this but yeah. they tried to do the install and I like did a bunch of research I was like what is Nielsen and uh -huh. didn't know what it was and they said you know they basically hook up equipment to your tv they can now hook it up to Netflix and see what mm -hmm. you're streaming, yeah. Apple TV, whatever. Yeah. But for whatever reason, my sound bar made it not, it couldn't connect. Oh, and really? so they ended up pulling it out of our house. It's like, no, like it. Yeah, because if you're if you're a full meter, you get like, you actually get paid for it you get every paid, month. Yeah, you get paid like a hundred bucks every month. Yeah. And it's like a $200 setup fee uh -huh. like, where they like, uh, not, they pay, they pay you. you the two, they pay the two, you, the, yeah. Like this can't be real. And so. Yeah. And so that's one of the ways that are, so that. Is mm -hmm. now the meter. That's what they they rate people off, and they they now do digital metering as well, watching what you watch on Netflix. Before it was literally a, a book, and they would pay you you know hundred bucks, two hundred bucks every you know four months out of the year to write down what you were watching at what times. Mm -hmm. Which is why in the TV we have we have the sweeps period is what it's called. Like if you've seen Anchorman, they talk about like oh we got the sweeps interview, <laughs> which that's not how sweeps work, but like sweeps exists uh -huh. in a lot of TV stations. February, May. August and November. I don't know. I've never worked at a station that took it that seriously, but February and November are the big ones where that's where you'll see a lot of the, the special reports. That's where you'll see so many of these stations put so much of their effort into those. But now with metering, Austin's a metered market. Oklahoma city's a metered market. We get metered every day of the year, pretty much. So instead of focusing all of our efforts into these four months out of the year, we, we focus our efforts every single day and specifically on every Wednesday here at News 9, we have a TSR, Targeted Special Report. Mm. We have a special. We have some sort of, you know, story that is promotable. And we have our marketing team promote it and be like, hey, on Wednesday night at 10, this story is going to air. And every week we do promotions for it. I think that's one of the ways that the way technology is changing, mm. is changing our industries. More, I think more and more stations are going to do that. Anytime I've, I've talked to some friends in the business who are still at stations that do sweeps as we know it, like, oh, yeah, we don't do it. You know, we're metered. We, we switch this way. And that, like the first response is always, oh, smart. <laughs> You've realized that that's such an antiquated way to do it. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing here is like instead of our sweep stories always being the, the what's in your water tonight at 10, like those mm -hmm. stories, we, I'm sure we do some where people would call it that. But we also do like cold case investigations where we have an anchor who is a private investigator and goes in and dives into these cold case and OSBI and, and the sheriff's office have like opened their books and been like, here's all of our investigations. You go through it and we're able to report on that and tell stories on that. We'll do everything from that to like a baseball league where the youngest guy was 70, mm -hmm. you know, like a feature on that. We have a very wide 
spectrum of things that are specials for us. A lot of stuff that I was doing at KV would have been like our TSRs here. Got it. That's the world I would have lived in if in this ecosystem. I see. So based on that sort of metering, is mm-hmm. that how, you know, you talked about like pushing in your chips and the story doing mm-hmm. well. Is that what you're measured on is the audience or how do you, how does a manager sort of measure how successful or the performance of a story? So it's a lot of like gut feeling like watching it and being like, oh, that was a good story. We we don't necessarily like, I'm not sitting there and being like, oh, we had a dip at 604. Whose story was at 604? Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're out. You know, like we're not looking, we're mm-hmm. not looking at that. I think honestly, producers are more measured by the viewership of a show. Got it. So MMJ is responsible for one story. Producers are who are lining up the newscasts. I mean, like this story is going to go and then this story and then mm-hmm. this story and then this story. So producers are more judged on, hey, your show is gaining numbers or your show is losing numbers. Mm-hmm. But as a reporter, it's more just people watching me like, that's that was a good story. Got it. There's that. also industry awards, which also help kind of reinforce, not only did you think it was a good story, a bunch of people thought it was a good story. Yeah. Um, so that helps. A lot of times we don't do what we do because of awards, mm-hmm. but they don't suck. They're nice. They're nice yeah. to have on the side. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So for those that are thinking about a career in journalism, Mm -hmm. what should they consider? Who is it for? Who is it not for? I think it's for anybody and everybody who wants to put in the work. Our industry is needing more and more good journalists and people willing to dive into stories and willing to do a little bit more digging and also look for the lighter side of life. Like We need a full spectrum of people. Newsrooms work best when you have not everybody trying to do the same stories. Mm -hmm. When you have people who have found either different different avenues and people dive into like one section of, of our news reporting, or they're just looking at different places or looking at different parts of our viewing area. But as far as like somebody who's just getting into it, it's, you know, if you want to put in the work, cause it's not easy, do it. It's fun. It's fun when it works and it's really hard when it, when it's hard, you know? Yeah. But it's also just, it's, it's reps, it's practice, it's getting training. National Press Photographers Association is probably the only reason I'm still in this business. It's an organization that talks about visual storytelling. They actually, in Norman, Oklahoma, every year, they have a workshop over OU spring break where they bring in journalists from around the country and it's hands-on breaking down every bad habit you have, building you up from the beginning and like creating building blocks. I went to it twice in college. If I didn't go to that, I don't think I'd be in the industry today. I really don't think I'd be in this business anymore. Yeah, that training helped set me up and and gave me a lot of the tools to be able to succeed and be able to continue to grow. Is this an annual training that they have? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, every single year. This year's in, in March. The last couple of years with COVID had been kind of moved around and shuffled and it had been in the summer, but it's getting back to its, it's every year in March. It's whenever OU has their spring break. They take over the journalism school, and it's the MPPA news video workshop. Oh, wow, yeah. Yeah. I was a tour at, at OU, and we'd always talk about what we have the number one or top three like journalism school in the nation. I don't know what it is now. I don't know. The numbers change. It's, it's, I mean, here, Arizona state, Mizzou, those are probably three. Northwestern has a really good one. Syracuse has a really good grad program, but it's, it's one of those where it's in the top, like, you know, 1% of journalism school that one mm-hmm. year it might be one, one year it might be eight. I don't know. Right, right, right. Yeah. But it's a good journalism program. Yeah. So what, what other advice do you have for, and it doesn't have to be specifically for journalism, mm-hmm. What other advice would you give to people who are in college or maybe have recently graduated? Mm-hmm. What advice do you wish you had had, you know, when you were around that age? I think getting whatever industry you want to get into, getting a real look into what that looks like and actually giving it a try is really the only way you're going to find out if you like it. So luckily journalism is set up with internships kind of across the country. A lot of stations have interns. Not all internships are created equal. You know, some internships, you're, you're the person going to get coffee, like the traditional stereotypical internship. I had an internship at a newspaper actually, where they had a video department and they handed me an ENG camera and they were like, we're going to assign you stories. If you find stories, great, but you're going to come in and you're just going to tell your own original reporting video story that will go on our website along with our our printed, you know, article. Most TV stations just legally, we can't have our interns do on-air work Mm -hmm. because then you're paying somebody less than what you'd have to pay somebody else. There's weird, you know, legal mumbo jumbo on that one. So, you know, finding that internship that allows you to actually get your, your hands on a camera or your hands writing stories and and really practicing and, and soaking up everything for journalism, that definitely works. I think that works for a lot of things, like actually getting real experience. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense because 
I was pre med in undergrad and I took the MCAT. So I well, failed made it out. farther than me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I realized later than you did that I wasn't a good fit for me. <laughs> yeah. So I took the MCAT and the part of that process to apply for medical school, there's this expectation that you log about 200 hours of volunteer work mm -hmm. at a hospital, at a clinic, yeah. at a pharmacy, somewhere touching healthcare where you're getting exposure to the space that you'd like to be in because they really want you to get a sense of what it's going to be like before yeah. you actually make a commitment and go to medical school. Because there's a lot of people that make it even further than we both did mm -hmm. and go to medical school, some even complete it and wish that they didn't go to medical school. And so yes. I think your advice is spot on that you should, if you can, try to get exposure, try to test it out, see if you like it or not. And that's that's another way for you to get more data points to get closer to figuring out what you're going to enjoy and like what you're going to really thrive at. And even if it's not exactly what you thought it was, like all of my internships were news internships. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I didn't switch to news until like the end of senior year. I was a sports guy in college. And when we did newscasts at, you know, at KU, I was in charge of the sports side of it. But I I did news internships every summer. Uh -huh. You know, that was the internships I, I, was, I was able to get and I, I had. And I learned from that. And again, that gave me more information so that when I ended up switching the news, I knew I could do it because I've been doing it. And a lot of those times, the storytelling side of it, I fell in love with. And I think a lot of times in sports departments, they get too caught up and it's part of what they have to do. We're in the highlights and heads is what we call it. So the highlights from the game and then the talking heads at the podium after. Hmm. Whereas really the storytelling, more times than not, sports storytelling, the, the cool feature stories, a lot of times fall to the news department because there's 18 MMJs and one of them can pitch it. Whereas the four sports people are busy doing other stuff. So for me, that was like, even though I went into news, I still got to do a lot of sports stories. Yeah. I got to cover a lot of, you know, championship parade type things. You know, those stories that ended up being some of the more memorable ones and some of the really fun ones to do that still kind of scratched that sports itch mm -hmm. I had, but I was still in the news department. Yeah. Even if it's not exactly what you think you're wanting, if it's in the same field and the same job, just in a, maybe a slightly different way, which maybe that's a journalism exclusive mm -hmm. thing. Um, getting those, those internships and those handouts experience, again, d data points, like you said. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So do you see yourself doing this for a long time or where do you want to take your career next? Where do I want to take I but I, I've told my bosses and our VP of news here, like the shift for me into this management role, as opposed to being, you know, a special projects MMJ, I had a dream job. I had a dream gig in Austin. Mm -hmm. And this one was a different dream, but also a dream gig where I still get to go tell stories, but I get to help people and do stuff that way. The shift into this side of it, probably two years earlier than like, if you really look at my career path when I would have wanted to make it, mm -hmm. but I'd rather that be two years too early than two years too late. So I think for me being this switch into management probably keeps me in the news industry maybe even longer than I would have been before and kind of keeps me where it's, you know, there's a almost a different career path within the same industry that I'm, I'm now on. Kind of hopped over laterally or skipped up a couple rungs or whatever it is. One of my biggest complaints with journalism is the way that, like, it's structured. MMJs and on-air talent, it's like you're either an MMJ and some people look at being a reporter as a promotion and then an anchor as another promotion. I look at them as all different jobs and, like, I had no desire to anchor. So like as an MMJ, like where do I grow? Right. A lot of times you're jumping markets to be able to grow, but like I liked Austin. I didn't want to leave Austin. Like how do I grow within here? And like I created that special projects role with that EP. And then I created the storytelling coaching side. Those were me almost creating rungs that didn't exist in an imaginary ladder. And then this job here, when I heard about it, was another rung. That, again, doesn't exist anywhere else. So it's a different ladder almost. Like I'm climbing more into that management side, but I think that had always been something I eventually was wanting to get into. Yeah. But this gave me a rung that, that wasn't there before. Yeah. And we keep coming back to the analogy of chips, but you yeah. have stored up and stocked up all these chips. And I've had managers tell me in the past that mm -hmm. you know, every two to three years, you should take a look at all the chips that you've collected. Because not only can you cash them in at your current organization, but you can take that and you can cash them in at other places too. For sure. At least you can look and start to spread some feelers and say, hey, here's what I'm capable of. Mm -hmm. See what other opportunities are there. And it'll do one of two things, right? You'll either be reaffirmed like, oh, where I'm at is right where I need to be. Yeah. And this is a great opportunity. Or you might be pleasantly surprised and find a new opportunity at another place. And for you, it sounds like that was here in Oklahoma City. I wasn't even looking for this though. Oh, like, yeah. yeah, I didn't even know, again, I didn't know this job existed. I had a mentor, Brett Akagi reached out to me and was like, hey, the station in Oklahoma City has this really cool job, doesn't exist anywhere else. Like you should take it seriously. It's funny, I, 
Kayla, my wife, mm. I, I went to her and I was like, hey, Kayla, you know, Brett wants me to take this job in Oklahoma City. I know you don't want to move to <laughs> Oklahoma City. Like, we're in Round Rock. We love Austin. This is great. She goes, well, why not? Why do we not want to move to Oklahoma City? And like, for me, again, I say most journalists across the country underpaid. This job was like a 40% increase in pay and a 20% oh, wow. decrease in cost of living. Mm -hmm. Those numbers are moving the right direction. Yeah. Um, so it ended up like working out that way, but like, I didn't think she was going to want to move, but she was like, Hey, let's give it a shot. Why not? Why can't yeah. we try it? You already had the tornado in Austin and Round Rock. So you were fully prepped like, for Oklahoma. Two months before we leave. <laughs> Brutal. And we were still like the month before we were leaving, we were trying to get our fence fixed still because it, mm. it went right through our backyard, tore everything up. But again, okay. So if our house got leveled, which one down the block did, mm -hmm. very different story than, you know, where we are now. I don't know. Like, it's weird to think about how little, if that shifted just a little bit farther south, like our house would have been in the direct path as opposed to the edge. Yeah. Yeah. Very fortunate. I guess yeah. everything happens for a reason. And we, we got lucky, so we moved to Oklahoma City and wanted to press our luck. I don't know. And here you are. <laughs> and here we're going to deal with a whole lot more. All right, last question yeah. and a more fun one. Okay. But do reporters have a different reporting voice that they use when they're recording? I'm trying to learn because I'm like, oh, maybe there's a specific reason. Is you like enunciate more? Is that? I do think different? enunciating more is, is a thing. If you... If you ask Kayla, I have a completely different voice. I like to think I, I write like I talk more so than not. But, like, I guess there is more of, like, you kind of have more of a, a, a bravitas to it, I guess would be the right way yeah. to say it. You want to make sure that people can hear you. You want to make sure your words are are clear. Again, we're maybe going too in the weeds on, like, how we construct stories. But, like, if there's a sound bite where somebody takes, like, a three-second pause, they're like, I just – and then they take a three-second pause and they're like, I really just wanted them here, whatever it is. Like, they're getting emotional. You can fit in lines of track. And so you might say those words slightly differently than like you would say anything else in the world. And like, mm -hmm. it's just really hard. And like, you would never say that if you're having a conversation with somebody, but like it works in that context. So do people have a reporter voice? Probably it's a sore subject. Okay. I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> so can you do me a favor? Can you close out the podcast episode? Thanking our guests for listening and to tune in for the next episode with your reporter voice. The reporter voice? The podcast is called How Do You Do That, if you'd like to throw that name in there. Hey, Kevin well. Arrow, how do you do that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know how to do, do it. Do it, do it, do it. Hey, everybody, thank you for watching. Really excited that you're here and joining John on this journey. Hey, Kevin Arrow, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. And thank you, Hank, for making time to do this. Of course. Thanks for inviting me. That's a wrap for this episode, and what a great one it was. I want to thank Hank for joining me and sharing his insights on journalism and for giving me a tour of the studio. It was a real treat to see all the amazing technology and tools that go into bringing people the news. As we wrap up this year, I'm looking forward to bringing you even more inspiring stories and insights from the people who are doing work they love and how they got there. In the meantime, I hope you have a happy and safe new year with your family and loved ones. John Pham, how do you do that?